was exploring forgiveness and it was this idea that actually in truth there is no such thing as a broken heart. We talk a lot about broken heartedness yeah, and broken hearts but what I began to see was that really it was just my expectations that got broken. Mm -hmm. It was my hopes, my wishes, my desires for a certain outcome in a certain situation that were really dashed and completely broken. But it was why I felt it was me that was broken was because I was so identified with what I wanted to have happen. Does that make sense? Yes, but, mm. but there's a conflict in that, what you want to have happen. Mm. When, when you are coming from a place of being broken mm. and needing to be fixed, you will always experience, or your, the, the results of your experience will always be being broken, mm. no matter how much you try to fix it. Mm. Because <laughs> the nature of that thought is self-fulfilling. I am broken, therefore, the more I struggle, the more I want to achieve to prove I'm not broken, must always result in my continuing to feel broken. Mm -hmm. You must begin with the belief that there's nothing wrong. That's the beauty of what The Course in Miracles teaches. Its fundamental precept is that we all take a journey from a place that we've never left. Mm -hmm. And that journey is really a journey from our real self into what appears to be a self-image yes. that is less than who we really are. Yes. And fundamentally we're journeying back, we're taking those moments, these healing crises if you like, where we could try to fix the self-image or we could actually let the self-image go and return then back to this self that actually was already happy, was already here, waiting for us. And how hard is that? Mm. When we have no memory yeah. of what that self is, it feels like we're, a t it feels like a, a sacrifice, a mm. complete sacrifice, because there's nothing there then for us to identify with. Mm. Everything we identify with now mm. is, is based upon the story we have created around this image of who we think we are. So there's nothing outside that story, but the part that we haven't mentioned yet that is the most important thing, the most important player, let's say, mm -hmm. within this story, this one whole story that the consciousness tells. And incidentally, it's also very significant for us to remember that as this consciousness is whole, mm -hmm. it is as a whole telling a broad story of sin and separation. Hmm. And then within that broad stroke, we all create our own individual stories of how sin and separation is real. Right. And they all look different, but they're all the same. So fundamentally, the plot is exactly the same. Totally. But we will embellish that plot with our own stories of how we've been wronged, of how we've tran been transgressed in whatever way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, within this consciousness, within this one whole consciousness, God gave us a break. Mm -hmm. Seeing how we were going to mess up mm -hmm. and recognizing that we could fall into our stories so deeply that we would apparently not remember anything. Mm -hmm. He thought, mm, maybe it would be a good idea if I kind of put a character in that consciousness that wasn't a part of the consciousness, but was a bridge between the reality of our creation and mm. this story we were telling. So this and is a bridge from our self-image back to the truth of who we are. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Mm. And we give that a, because we, we are creatures of identification, we identify this as a let's say, a presence. Mm. It is far more than a presence, obviously. But we identify it as a presence and we give it a name and call it the Holy Spirit. I call it the God Self. Mm. But this, this beautiful presence is not deceived at all by the story within which 
it has become a player. And we all have access to that presence because it is in our consciousness. It is in our mind, our one mind. Now, the moment you begin to speak of that presence, it does feel very, very good. It feels very, very sane. It feels there's just something beautiful about it. Could you maybe expand just a little bit more on, on the feeling of that presence? Because I'm very aware that the moment we give something a name, we often stop really exploring it. We, we stop at the name. Yes. But if we were just to go past the name of Holy Spirit or God Self or Shekinah or whatever we want to call it, could you just describe a little bit of how that presence feels for you? What you feel mm. and what everyone feels when, when you present yourself, which you do so beautifully, is not what the words are describing, it's not mm. the name, mm. but it is your knowing of what that name encompasses. Mm. That's what you're communicating. Mm. Mm. And that's what, that's what brings this beautiful feeling that, that always springs up within us. We know somewhere beyond this story, we know, because what is true is is always going to remain true. And as much as we would like to ignore our or what we perceive, what we have concocted, we, we never in truth totally lose sight of what that truth is. And so when you hold the awareness of it, you spark it in me. Mm. And it opens a door in my mind for that memory then to again begin to bloom. Mm. And that's how we really and truly must learn to communicate with one another. That's what forgiveness does. Mm. Forgiveness, well, first of all, let's, let's go back and, and just give a brief description of what Jesus in the Course in Miracles calls forgiveness. Great, yes. It is the recognition that what you think happened didn't. It is a blanket denial that the world you see is true. In other words, it is, it is the bridge itself. It is the connection to this God-Self presence that recognizes that this story is nothing but a story. And we are, we are the storyteller. So the sense that the world is, is, is an effect, not a cause. It's not the world that's doing this to us. Right. Yeah. Right. So the ultimate use of forgiveness mm -hmm. is to recognize that nothing happened that, that you could forgive. You were, simply, you were simply choosing to see your story in a different way. Hmm. So it strikes me that we, we have these sort of two levels of almost of like story, which could be characterized as that which happens in time and space. So it's the things that seem to appear and disappear, that appear to come and go, including, frankly, my image of myself which has to be constantly updated and worked on and touched up and foundation and makeup and that sort of thing. And then we have something which doesn't change and that isn't altered, that somehow feels more real. It's more true somehow. And it seems to me that what you're talking about here is, is that forgiveness is the way home in the sense that it takes us out of all of the stories and places us back into the awareness of a timeless, unalterable truth. That is the mm. final goal of forgiveness. And the bridge to do that is a presence. And this is so important, isn't it? Because frankly, when we're on our knees, that's not a good time for us to work out how to do our life, is it? Probably not. We're probably not going to come up with a great idea. And yet I must say, I notice 
that often when I have been on my knees, that's the precise moment when I think, right, I'm going to sort it all out now. <laughs> so it's not, the, it's not the right time. The thinking, if you like, that's got me on my knees isn't really going to be the thinking that gets me back up. I have to go to a presence. Yes, you do. In myself. Yes. That can help me to see the difference between a story and a storyline and the, the truth. Exactly. Okay. Exactly that. So with this presence, because I suppose the nature of a self-image being something that we're so identified with means almost by definition that we make the presence mysterious. How can we become more familiar with this presence? We make it presence? more than mysterious. We make, it, <laughs> we make it unavailable. Right. Yes. Because we have been unavailable to it. Yes. Right. Yes, it is just too difficult for us to to try to identify with something that is so abstract. Mm. We don't recognize, as a matter of fact, that the true nature of our mind is completely abstract. Mm. It must be when you remove the concept of differences, mm. then everything be seems to become abstract. Mm. But how is it possible for us to identify with this thing that, that doesn't fit with the mold? Mm. Well. This was, the, this was the chief primary <clears throat> blessing that Jesus was able to bring into our consciousness. He has given us a story about his travels around the world, about his, his belief that God was nothing but a perfectly loving presence. And yet, as he traveled the world, he could find no evidence of that loving presence anywhere. And of course, it was assumed that God created the world. So this great conundrum existed in his thinking. If God created the world and God is only loving, then where is the evidence of it? Why and he couldn't all the find wars? It. Why all the conflict? Exactly. Why all the pain? Exactly. It's such an important point, though, isn't it? Just to be with that even. If God is really a God of unconditional love, and God created this, it doesn't add up, does it? It can't. It can't, can it? No. If we really accept the presence, that that which created us is unconditional love, we have to accept that anything that isn't love has been a temporary story we've made. We've got to accept <laughs> that, haven't we? Because there's no... There's no other alternative. The logic of it is, therefore, us to see. After he had spent well over a year traveling around the area as much as he was able to India and I don't know where all exactly he went but that's not important anyway. But he finally came back to his little home village and he had this lovely little place where he used to go to contemplate, meditate. And he went there and he he decided he wasn't going to leave until he had resolved mm. this issue, this, this real dilemma in his thinking. And so he said, this was the, you know, the Bible reports as the fabled story of the 40 days and 40 nights. Mm. The length of time is irrelevant, but he did decide he was going to stay there until he was able to resolve it. And at some point into his thinking came an awareness this is another very important thing for us to remember. How that awareness or why that awareness could come to him. And let's get into that in a moment. But as he sat there, absolutely determined to reconcile this conundrum, the awareness came into his mind and a voice began to speak to him. And it said, no, you are not wrong that God is all loving but you have been looking for him in the wrong place. He is not in the world you have made, but he is within your mind. And that began his relationship with this presence. And it was the thing that transformed his thinking entirely and became the basis for everything he taught from then on. Everything 
then became a teaching from the standpoint of oneness and the, the precept that there's nothing wrong with you. Hmm. Now, just to clarify that point, hmm. why, why must something come into your mind? Because we are the presence of the mind that has created all of creation. There is no distinction that can be made between the mind of God and our mind. There's only the one mind. And there is no distinction in reality that can be made between God's creation and God. Because God's creation is God. And so with that power, it is the nature of creation to express itself. And we would call that, in this frame of thinking, we would call that an intention. And so, because we are both the one, or the part of the mind, that has the intention and the part of the mind that answers the intention, you can see, if that, when that thought begins to make sense to you, that you can see then that it's impossible to have an intention that is not fulfilled. So the answer is, is clearly within us. And I wonder, Tom, therefore, if we were to go to the moment when something appears to happen to us that we deem to be hurtful or wrong or bad in any way. And let's face it, you know, this could be as big as a, you know, landmines going off, you know, the, the death of loved ones. I mean, it's happening yeah. every single moment, every moment, isn't it? Somewhere in the world, people are facing these, these huge, huge moments where there is fundamentally the potential for a lifelong grievance or something else. Let's start there. How can forgiveness begin to work where we can choose between a lifelong grievance and something else? Forgiveness is literally an intention to find an alternative to judgment. Mm -hmm. And when you have the intention to find an alternative to judgment, you will find it. And that alternative is what we have just described as the God Self, the Holy Spirit. And in that presence is our release from the need to judge, because in that presence it is known. There is nothing there to judge. Now, we don't immediately get that. That's not something that rushes in the first moment that the intention, that there becomes an intention to see an alternative because we are, we are way too immersed in this practice of, of being guilty. Yes, yeah, yeah. But if we allow it, that is the beginning. And then with each occasion that we, that we experience the gratification of, of being free of the effects of our judgments, we are encouraged to pursue it further. But in those opening moments of when we have perceived something has happened to us and therefore we're feeling all of the feelings that go with grief, that entire range of injustice, you know, frustration, feeling unloved and unlovable, um, feeling um, angry, feeling hopeless you know those feelings they really they appear to just rush in at that time yes. in those moments how can we begin to apply this soothing balm of forgiveness in a way that would feel real to us when jesus discovered <clears throat> that there was an alternative the awareness of that alternative had been introduced into our consciousness and so it is there mm. And it began at that point that we, 
that the consciousness itself, in all of its varying various expressions, began to experiment with the, the concept that we're calling forgiveness, mm -hmm. of overlooking mm -hmm. and feeling the relief that comes from it. Mm -hmm. It is that, that that encourages us to continue to, to know that what we really want is not what comes to us in grief. It's a very difficult thing for us to recognize, and yet most of us don't turn away from our story until we finally come to some kind of a recognition that that story is not going anywhere. Mm. And we become so tired of the pain and the suffering and the agony that, that, that we have created in this story that we in one form or another, utter those magic words, there's got to be a better way. Yeah. And that, that is possible because inwardly, as I said before, we do know, buried beneath all of this story, we do know there is another way. Mm. And that, that is such a big opportunity, that moment, isn't it? When we, when we begin to tire of our own grievances, when we begin to tire of the suffering that we've identified with. That's a, such a key moment. I just want to take you back though, just again, if I may, to, to the heat of the moment, mm -hmm. when you're feeling all those feelings, when this is in the early moments after something appears to have happened to you. The literally, the practical how-to in that heat of the moment is what? Is to recognize the teaching that there is another way. That's why it was so important for Jesus to have brought this into our consciousness. And so now it's in and we can all use it. That's what the teaching of A Course in Miracles is all about. Mm. So somewhere in us we say, I, I am having the experience of grief, I'm having the experience of anger, but I'm willing to see that there's another way. Yes, and you may not even recognize, well, odds are you won't recognize. Mm what happened with Jesus, or, mm. or that there is this feeling floating around in our consciousness that has suddenly come to you. Mm. you, you in the beginning, you will not, you will not recognize mm. that something has come to you from the consciousness which you don't even recognize as being a part of your own individual perception. But it's there. Hmm. Now, this, as you say this, then it strikes me that, that forgiveness is, begins really, though, as willingness. Be, reaching the bottom of the, of the barrel, so to speak, mm -hmm. is where, for most of us, that initial willingness mm -hmm. comes from. Mm -hmm. My, my self-image, the me that has been hurt, isn't going to be doing the forgiving in this process. And that's why it's so important, Robert, for us to recognize the alternative. Mm -hmm. This is not a different way of using our perception. Mm -hmm. This is a way of bypassing our mm -hmm. perception. Mm -hmm. And so it must be recognized as an alternative. But quite honestly, in the beginning, mm -hmm. we do. We, we try to let the ego also be in charge of the forgiveness. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. Because at least the door has been opened. Mm -hmm. And as I say, you may not recognize it, mm -hmm. uh, not you. We as an ego consciousness may not recognize how this presence is functioning in our consciousness. We'd be totally unconscious of it. Mm -hmm. And yet it is very actively, constantly functioning. Mm -hmm. There is no thought mm -hmm. in the ego's perception that, has, that ever comes up Mm. that is not immediately transformed into a thought that can lead out of the experience of the perception. That's the function of the God Self. It's a translator of sorts. It just converts everything. So for every thought of pain, there is essentially another interpretation. Of how to remove the pain, how to be free of the pain. And initially, our job then in the heat of the moment is simply is to be willing. 
to be able to say, I know there's a better way. Yes. I want a better way than this. Yes. And I'm, and I'm, I'm open to, ex to experience this. And the farther you go along that line of thinking, mm. the more apparent it becomes what the release really is. Mm. And the help, it strikes me, may appear to come from outside of myself, but in a way this is really, of course, an appeal to the truth inside of me. It will seem initially to come from outside yourself yeah. because we think that's where everything comes from. A loving friend. Uh, a book. Yes, a absolutely. Teaching, yeah. A guru. Some, some angel arrives, mm. offering us the possibility that this lifelong grievance that I have in danger of experiencing and holding on to forever doesn't have to, doesn't have to happen. It feels like it's like who I am won't really be able to handle this grievance, but who I really am welcomes is going it. to be able to do something with this. Welcomes it with open arms. Mm. Mm. And who so, you really are, of course, is this presence that we're calling the God Self. It is most generally referred to as the Holy Spirit. I have kind of coined the, the phrase God Self because to me, that reminds me constantly that I am not appealing to something different or outside of me, but to the God created me. Mm. Okay, so we've had the heat of the moment. We, we're doing what we can, uh, which is to be open and to be willing. And then it strikes me often there's a dance between being willing and holding on, being willing and holding on, um, which gets us hopefully ultimately to the point where we do tire of holding on to a grievance. What you are describing is to me the foundation and the function of this thing that we're trying to establish called 